Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back again to another Dank Hour here. I'm London, your master of moderation, dictator of dialogue, cultivator of conversations. I'm happy to be back here again with all of you this week here on the Dank Hour. We have a very special guest that, that will be joining us throughout the year um, as time goes by and, and, and trying to check it out. And essentially, we're going to have a bug guy come on and or, or, or pathology to come on. You're going to come on, Matt, and we're, we're going to enjoy your company every few months. Um, so we're just trying to get everybody a head start on what to get prepared for in the garden in spring, but also just to have a chat and see where things are at. We have a good conversation about the usual usual thing. Um, I'm excited, but there the, you should make sure to check out some of the other shows going on on Future Cannabis Project, but also check out down below. We have our Patreon open now, so go check that out if you want. You can get a t-shirt. I gotta order myself a t-shirt so that everybody can see me wear the t-shirt. It's pretty cool. It'll be fun. Get everybody a t-shirt. But how's it going, Matthew? Why don't you start off with a little basic introduction of yourself, what you do, where you're from. Not that people don't already know who you are, um, but and then we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Matthew Gates. I'm an integrated pest management specialist, and I've been working in the cannabis space for about 13 years now. Um, uh, mostly working with um, cannabis at this point in my entire career, but I have worked in other crops as well. And a lot of other really common crop pests are also found in cannabis. So that's a nice synergy. And um, right now I am, so you might also know me from my educational YouTube channel, Zenthanol, which has the same name as Zenthanol Consulting. And um, you can check me out at uh, zenthanol.com for professional inquiries. But um, I'm posting a lot of interesting research uh, lately about plant health and how insect biology works. And um, currently I'm writing a book about what I like to use as a concept called the Everswarm, which is like basically all the various pests that we have to deal with and how they interact with plants and what kind of what we have to do to appreciate about pests in order to like at the very smallest level, even to the largest scale level, uh, what we have to consider with regards to pest resistance, pest management, that kind of thing in a way that's holistic and ecologically conscientious. Awesome. And of course, we are getting into uh, uh, the, the funnest part of the year where all of our farmers get to plant. So I'm going to I'm going to start off with a basic, super simple question, and then we'll start lining up the rest of the fun questions from the rest of the crew to, to happen. So what are kind of what do we do? We're jumping into our year this year, whether we've been growing for a dozen years or or, or five or this is our first year. Um, what what are some things that we can suggest to get people rolling into this spring of of 2024 and make sure that they that they're preparing their plants in the most way? Because this everybody I know is either getting seeds together, they're popping seeds for their outdoor crop, or they're getting things rolling out there. I mean, it's 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 warm enough for tomatoes where I am, so I'm like, it's, get rolling. Uh, what can we do? And what are, what are our thoughts on using, um, you know? neem oil specifically I, I it's it's a controversial subject that a lot of people don't dig into but i'd like to know like what, what's their thoughts on using neem oil in the early portion of the plant you have the plant health and life well uh well one thing i would say it's sort of cliche but people have said various things to the effect of start clean stay clean and that kind of a thing i think it's very important um if you've it depends on how you're growing too. If you're growing indoors or if you're growing in a tent or something like that in a home grow setting, obviously it uh, definitely pays to make sure that everything is kind of clean before you you uh, you start your plants and that sort of a thing. That's obvious. Uh, that's pretty obvious. Another thing though, if you're growing outdoors, I think that is important and something that I've been reminded about a lot living in Southern California with all the storms we've been getting with the atmospheric rivers and things like this is that um, you know, and especially if it's been snowing or you've had other kinds of inclement weather, um, you know, make sure that that disruption hasn't um, uh, hasn't affected too much or hasn't brought a bunch of like detritus and debris into your into your property. And also pay attention because, like for example, for where I live, um, if we don't get a lot of rain, which is common, then you know there's not a whole lot of uh, plant matter and weeds and that sort of thing. 
on your property potentially, but when there is a lot of irrigation, that kind of thing, then you can get a lot more uh, plant growth and that can, that can be beneficial in some ways, but can also mean, it can also be a, a, a way to harbor other pests, especially generalist pests like spider mites and, and things that can feed on tons of different kinds of plants They can establish nearby and then get into your crop pretty soon. And if you, and if this happens early when you're germinating your seeds, or if you have small, younger plants and it gets a, away from you, you can um, you know, be very stunted or have to start over somewhat, uh, which obviously adds the time for for harvest and that kind of a thing. For as a directin, though, I don't think it's a terrible idea to use as a like um, uh, if you if you have like a quarantine system or if you want to make sure that your plants are not negatively affected by various pests from establishing, you might apply it at a regular interval potentially. But it depends if you're taking cuttings, there's different strategies. If you're starting seeds, that's a, that's a different thing entirely. So it does really, it really is contextual. And I think that's an important aspect of IPM too, is that there's no, uh, you know, one size fits all uh, perspective. I think that, um, you know, that's probably the biggest question I get asked from a lot of people is like, what's the best way to deal with X? And the answer is definitely going to depend on what your own uh, sort of context or capabilities are. <laughs> awesome sorry it's super late here i'm a little bit tired no problem well as always beautifully answered and, and well well said I'll, I'll let johnny step up and get into the next next stage all right um so i guess in london kind of touched on like things that we should be you know starting off you know thinking about before getting planting um what are some some paths that will be able to like overwinter and and linger around in old plant debris and like what are some of like the ranges you know like will hard freeze kill off you know a cannabis aphid or will they kind of still persist um you know from season to season regardless this is a really great question it's where my mind was going to um a lot of these pests like for example, a lot of insect pests will overwinter in like an egg or a pupal stage if they have a pupal stage. So like for the aphids, generally like um, rice root aphid and cannabis aphid, they overwinter as eggs like a lot of other aphids do. Some aphids overwinter as adults, uh, but generally speaking, that's not the case. And uh, maybe in the future, we'll find that there's maybe some, some more technicalities related to that, but that generally is the case for, for example, like aphids. Uh, what I think of the most, especially when I consider how um, here in sunny San Diego is a little bit different from like Michigan or Illinois or someplace like that, where you, you may still have quite a bit of um, cold weather um, and it hasn't quite opened up uh, yet. So with budworm moths, oftentimes they are overwintering in the pupil stage in the soil. And so what can happen is that um, he, down here in the southwest, they will start to activate and they'll become more common. And then the adults will actually move and they can move quite a long distance. Um, they've been they've been tracked moving from like Texas to Arkansas, like 750 kilometers or something, which is massive. And, and what, what's also been shown in research is that budworm moths in general can move from like South America to North America or like I was saying, from like southwest United States to northeast and those populations actually, when they start going, they actually, when they're traveling, they will mate with other populations around these other areas. And the significance of this is that when they do mate, they're passing genes on that can be very beneficial. Maybe they've um, become more adapted to plants that we care about, like cannabis, for example, um, or, or they become more adapted to certain environments or, or desiccation or, or overhydration, maybe because it, it's very wet where, they are, where they're at. But all these different traits can can combine and you end up getting this like better than the sum of their parts situation. But instead of it being beneficial to us, it's detrimental. So that's something I've been focused on a lot. Um, uh, other insect pests like are going to be like that too. Like like we've talked about before, thrips. Um, thrips generally are associated with like uh, changes in like wind and barometric pressure and things like this. So again, they might overwinter as like a pupil stage, Western flower thrips in particular have a penchant for having a very wide uh, sort of temperature range that they can survive at, not necessarily be very active at, but they can go into very low 
low uh, Celsius temperatures, maybe single digit. I'm forgetting the exact amount myself, but it will be contextual. My point though is that kind of like with the budworm moths, they might activate in a warmer part of a country or, um, or something like this first, and then they'll expand out. Um, so even if you're in a place where springtime is still more snowy or more uh, tumultuous, uh, that population is going to be coming in soon. Right on. And what do you think, like, as far as, like, will uh, cannabis aphid, will they be able to withstand, like, a really hard freeze for weeks on end? Um, will, like, you know, is that going to be able to, to take, care, take care of them? Or is it going to be just, like, kind of just doesn't make a difference one way or the other? Well, I think that... Um... There's not a whole lot of research on cannabis aphid biology, so a lot of what I'm going to say here is kind of speculative. But if they're like other aphids, and like the overwintering I was saying earlier, a lot of aphids will produce these egg stages in the autumn so they can overwinter. And then they'll hatch um, in the springtime, hopefully at or near uh, their host plant. In the case of cannabis aphid, they only feed on cannabis. So uh, for their population to work, and they've had this relationship for a very long time, uh, there's there's kind of a guarantee to some degree, or at least there has been historically, that even if the cannabis plant, which is typically an annual, right, in, in nature, um, when it dies, hopefully that around the time when the seedlings are starting to sprout, the cannabis aphids can also activate at or around that same time, so it's kind of synchronized. So I think that there, but see, a lot of times it's not enough to just be like an egg. They, they oftentimes have to be in the debris. And this is true for a lot of other insects that might have a pupil stage where they're in the debris or, or like a larval stage that's gone dormant in some way. Um, they, they still have to be sheltered. Um, if they're just exposed to the environment, which is one way you can control them. In this case, you might take a bunch of this debris that they could be in. I know like, for example, the, or, the navel orange worm moth in like almonds and pistachios and things like that, they'll get these mummies because the larvae will get into the, um, the nut cluster and they'll pupate in it. And so it's very common SOP to like actually go out and destroy all of these like mummy nuts because they'll, if you don't, then the moths will come out and you'll have a way worse problem. And because budworm moths, for example, and a lot of these other pests can feed on so many other plants, unlike for example, cannabis aphid, um, I think there's more of an importance of like being aware of your property and maybe trying to destroy um, like dead or decaying uh, uh, plant matter that might be hosting this. This is also true for like fungal pathogens and that kind of a thing. But for cannabis aphid, I feel like if you're if you're getting rid of and processing, like it's fine to compost um, a lot of these things, for example, like the insects, they have to feed on living tissue to survive, like the cannabis aphid. So if you're taking all of your material and processing into compost or something like that, that really shouldn't be much of an issue. Right on, thanks. Uh, I think Mark is next. Hey, Matt. Dude, just before you go there, Dr. Mark, I will let people know that if you send me um, some bug pictures before the end of the episode, we'll, we'll try and do a what the fuck is that moment and try and get, get quiz, quiz Matt on his uh, bug, bug picture knowledge. Um, anyways, sorry for the brief <laughs> interruption. Yeah, I welcome it. <laughs> so, like, a uh, close-up of a fly's eye and all that stuff. <laughs> oh, that might be a little bit of, I mean, a bunch of Amatidia, I don't know. I might not be able to do that. But that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Yeah, well, hey, Matt. Nice to meet you. I don't think we've met before, so I'm a big fan of your work. Only briefly in the past. It's okay. Oh, have we met before? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, very in very passing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right, I must have been high or something. Um, Possible. So, um, so yeah, let let's talk about something that, that maybe we talked about before in Clubhouse. Um, I seem to remember a conversation with you along these lines. I don't know if you remember. I'll say one word, and I think it'll instantly you'll remember it. I think, or at least. I think we had this on the future cannabis project while it was a clubhouse room. I seem to remember talking about it because 
I was like, well, what am I going to talk to Matt about? Well, let's talk about this. Lace wings. Okay. Right? Do you remember the conversation? Maybe not. Was it lace wings or lace bugs? Do you no, remember? lace wings. Lace wings. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So maybe not. I London, who's the guy? God, I think he's from Latin America. We used to have Claude on, and you you were definitely Claude, on with Claude. Claude. Yeah, Claude. 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 Yeah. That was yeah. it. But I think you were in the room, Matt, if I remember correctly. That might have been, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's funny what you remember looking at the little clubhouse app on your phone, right? <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Who's, whose icon was what, whose avatar and all that. So, yeah, so, so Lace Wings, super interesting, right? I mean, this is like, it's like Star Wars for bugs, right? Bugs that eat bugs. <laughs> so send in the bugs. We got the bugs coming in. Absolutely. <laughs> army of lace wings just flying in to eat all these aphids because they love eating aphids, right? So the conversation with Claude, that's that was the guy. Yeah, the conversation with him was, well, what we know from some work that I did, this was many, many years ago, is that um, the essential oil of catmint. So catmint, you know, or what's affectionately known as catnip, right, is a... Uh, um, uh, it belongs to the same family as cannabis and basil, you know, all these oil bearing herbs and similar to cannabis, it expresses its oil in a uh, glandular trichome on the surface of the leaf. Sound familiar? <laughs> so, uh, but that's basically where the, where the, uh, the commonality sort of splits, right? So nepetalactone is the primary component in catmint oil that's responsible for the feline mm -hmm. response, right? They want to listen to jazz and eat Twinkies, right? <laughs> so, and it's, it's interesting to note that that, um, that response is uh, universal throughout the feline kingdom. So not only to our fine little furry friends that rub around our feet next to the sofa at night, but also the big, big cats in the jungle, they also succumb to cat mint too as well. So, um, but there's no like CB1 receptor for the compound. I, and may, maybe there's a cannabinoid-like receptor that, that these things. But he, here's here's the question for you, just from an IPM point of view. So, so okay, so so catnip, catnip oil, or the essential oil of the catmint plant, is enriched with this mono or this bicyclic monoterpenoid called nepetalactone. You know, and it's it's the thing that attracts cats, right? So that means that there's going to be cat piss, right? Wherever there's cats, cats pee, right? <laughs> so, okay. So why would Mother Nature evolve this biosynthetic pathway in this herbaceous mint? And so, as it turns out, you know, a lot of the evolutionary, well, the idea around evolutionary development in plants, especially when it comes to volatiles, is that they're attracting pollinators, right? It's the ones that evolved these pathways to attract pollinators that were more successful than the neighboring fields. Those fields won out genetically, right? So it's interesting to ponder, you know, why would Mother Nature evolve this plant that attracts cats, get some high, get some stone, but also attracts lace wings? So again, as it turns out, lace wings can eat aphids. So is there an IPM strategy that involves using catmint, you know, barrier plantings around gardens? Now you're attracting lace wings and maybe populating lace wings where they weren't before. And now there's a you know, population of aphids. Well, they're just gonna get eaten for lunch, right? So I was just wondering if you'd ever worked with lace wings or ever heard about this effect of cat men attracting them. And is there an IPM strategy that would involve, say, putting barrier plantings around fields of cannabis with uh, cat men? It's funny because I was like two months ago, I was looking at this exact thing. Uh, I was like, I was just I was trying to remind myself because. Uh, actually, I believe catnip is in the Lamiaceae, which is the it is, family, yes. so like peppermint, that kind of stuff. Basil, peppermint, and, yeah, they're all in that. <laughs> yeah, because I, I had actually, I had bought some um, uh, mountain mint, which I forget the species name at the top of my head. 
but um, I was excited because it was very shade tolerant. Um, and I was, I was trying to get some shade tolerant uh, flora. Is it a broad and leaf or a narrow leaf? Is it broad, broad leaf mint? Um, no, it's actually very, the, 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 I got a, <laughs> I got a, uh, I didn't have very much upper gro uh, plant growth in the phyllosphere. Mm -hmm. It's mostly, it was mostly root. So it's still establishing, but the, the few like sprigs of stem and leaf material that I, that I have that's alive. They're very small leaves. They're not like a peppermint plant with this like lancelate right. kind of like wide um, right. uh, arrow tip kind of leaf, you know, or serrated or anything like that. It's very like if you were to, I'm sure that once it grows more, it definitely has that kind of, I, I've seen other pictures where it's got that kind of like mint, like boxed, I believe as like a boxed like stem, like a lot of mint plants do. Uh, but the leaves are quite small. It's kind of like... Um, it looks a lot more like a rosemary than like a peppermint plant, mm -hmm, for example. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, uh, what was I, I reminded myself that nepetalactone was that was the compound important for um, what you were saying, like kind of like that attraction that cats have. Uh, but but more broadly, when it comes to using things like a push pull system uh, for like plants, or like doing like or like having sentry plants or banker plants. I just did a, a big, I want to say it's like the ultimate aphid analysis video, which is what I titled the video. It was about aphids and, and a, a small section of it had to do with this exact uh, question. How can people sort of, um, or what are some of the effects of like having like a banker plant and accruing uh, aphid parasitoids and things like that? And how does that process happen? And one of the interesting things is that actually, a different compound, um, uh, E-beta-farnesine, which is very common in a whole whole bunch of plants. Uh, they, um, it's it's like the it's also produced by aphids as an alarm response. Mm -hmm. And I was reading some some researchers that were speculating that maybe aphids acquire the ability to make E-beta-farnesine. Um, like they didn't, it wasn't originally their like alarm pheromone of, tro of choice. And despite there being a ton of different species, not all of them react the same way, but a lot of them do react by like actually just falling off of the plant and trying to go somewhere else. Um, but some plants, if they produce it continuously, um, they act, some aphids will actually become, um, desensitized to it. And so they don't react in like a fear-based response, which is interesting. But some of these um, predators, like parasitoid wasps, they will come and attract it. I think that there's a way to use this, but it's hard to quantify the effects sometimes. And then um, I will say this. I, I'm a big fan of using banker plants, especially for aphids and aphid parasitoids and lacewing larvae. Although I wouldn't, I don't think that, because um, lacewings are super voracious. So it would be difficult to kind of raise multiple um uh, predators at once or biocontrol agents. Mm -hmm. This would this mostly I think I would try to focus on the parasitoid wasps that like need to parasitize an aphid, whereas lacewings can actually eat other insects too. Uh, but I'm getting ahead, I'm getting away from your question a bit. But the reason I bring it up is because if you amass parasitoid wasps from your local environment, that can be really beneficial. But there's one caveat, and that's that research shows that if you have banker plants with a bunch of parasitic wasps, you can also get parasitic wasps of those parasitic wasps called hyperparasitoids. So they'll literally go and seek out aphids that have the wasp in them, the larva that's developing, and then they'll parasitize that larva. I don't know. That seems like it's surprising that some that there'd be so, so many of these other wasps that would also, uh, you know, kind of have this secondary effect, this tertiary um, trophic level. Um, so I think that there's a benefit to it, but it can be hard to quantify some of these externalities. And people will come back to me and say, well, well, I used the wasp, but they didn't work very well. And I think that part of that is because there's these extrinsic factors that, um, need to be monitored or considered. And it takes some, some detail to accomplish that, uh, really appropriately. Otherwise things can get away from you. I have a really simple question that I bet you a lot of people would love to ask and maybe people are afraid to ask, but I don't, I don't feel shy about sounding dumb. <laughs> so I'll just go ahead and ask, you know, I, I, I got I'm a, I'm a chemist, right? And so I understand the chemistry and I'm not a cultivator and I'm certainly not an IPM expert and not a, a 
expert at anything having to do with cultivating large grows of cannabis. But when I go through some warehouses, I see these yellow cards. <laughs> what what are they and what do they do? <laughs> what are those yellow cards? <laughs> so for, for, for some people, those yellow cards are supposed to be a way to kill all of the flying pests that they come across. But actually, that's not the right way to use them in most cases. Um, yellow glue traps or yellow sticky cards, as they're affectionately called a lot of times, those are um, generally used for um, kind of like a passive trap. So you can tell what's going on in your area. I wouldn't really rely on them to control any one pest, but like for example, um, I would often work with people where they would replace them like every week or so. They might hang them in the crop space, but they also would maybe hang it around the facility, outside of a facility, if they're at a facility or their greenhouse or their tent or whatever their environment is sort of inside the space that's plant touching essentially and the space outside of it. You can get an idea of some of the things that are moving around because right. yellow and what's sometimes called uh, B violet, which is like an ultraviolet or like yellow that right. has like a, um, I'm not really being very articulate here, but they apparently insects see it and it's very, very um, attractive right. uh, for them. And so some insects have different sensitivities, but a lot of insects that are pests will home in on the yellow coloration. And there might even be some UV reflectances added to it as well. But um, that's what they're for, essentially. But there's no pesticide on there. It's just an adhesive that they just get stuck yeah. to. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And then you might take them down and look and say, huh, you know, I haven't seen a white fly here ever. And I see a white fly right, right here on this card. Right. I only see yeah. a couple. Well, Therefore now I'm going to go them. check around that area. Yeah. Yeah, they, they kind of remind me. I'm old enough to remember these. I don't know if anybody else on the panel does. Remember the old um, shell, no pest strips? Right. They used to what? come in like this lantern that you'd hang kind of like in your overhang on your porch and it would attract all the mosquitoes. Oh, like fly trap paper. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've seen yeah I, I think yeah. it actually had an insecticide in there because it came from shell. And as you know, shell chemicals had a had a big agricultural um, uh, insecticide discovery group. Um, but I always thought of those things whenever I saw those yellow cards. I'm like, man, are those just like modern day versions of the shell no pest strip or what? I mean, yeah, basically. And, um, you know, some products out there, I think that uh, they're trying to move in a direction to be a little bit more sustainable because it's a big plastic card, right? Um, yeah. So like maybe the glue has to be really adhesive right. for some dainty insect that can just like just hey, they you know, can very lightly touch it. It's but you don't want to necessarily use this, like they could probably like, uh, make it out of distillate, right? I mean, THC distillate is so fucking sticky, right? Just put it on a yellow card, make the card out of hemp stock paper, and now you have an environment. Then people would like, then maybe a person would take to like sampling the glue, and that might not be very good. Yeah, I guess you could want, just put a warning on people want to smoke those with, cards, with right? prices in the cannabis market the way they're going. You could probably have that pretty to be pretty cost effective in the long run. I don't know what it is for for <laughs> carbon paper, but that anyway. was some that was some low hanging fruit. So I was going to uh, I was going to let somebody else make that joke, but yes. <laughs> 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 Go ahead, <doctor. laughs> Thanks, Matt. I have to find the unmute button. I'm unmuted now. Okay. So, <laughs> hi, Matthew. It's good to see you again. Always yeah. nice to talk to you, and I always learn something awesome. I have a three part question. It's not a stump that it's not a stump the scientist um, question, though. So, I was wondering what issues are the most common that you see like all the time that is just like, you know, just really common. What's the hardest to control once you have it? And then at what point do you just burn it to the ground and say, start over? <laughs> uh, answering backwards first, I think that like, in a lot of cases, I think there's something that you can be that can be done, but a, a problem, a stickler that answers your last question and kind of your first question, although it's not a pest, is actually kind of a very basic business or organizational problem that I encounter a lot, which is like not 
thinking that you're going to need to do something, I guess, is the best way to put it. Like, uh, maybe you think it's like planning for failure. Like, oh, we don't need this. I'm not going to have a pest problem. I already had my pest problem last time. This time's going to be different. Um, or some sort of mentality to that effect, I think, is uh, maybe corrosive to the cultivation process a little bit. Because sometimes things happen that you just don't expect will happen. And I think that that's the really important thing is having kind of a preventative and proactive mindset. Um, uh, if you don't have like any resources or if you've written, if you've, if you've got a pest population that's damaged your crop to the point where if we're talking in like a business sense and an economic sense, then, um, you know, if, if basically you have no harvest or most of your harvest isn't there, you know, that's, that's going to be very difficult. And so if you reach that point, and it's too expensive, just like with a lot of crops, maybe, you know, you have to start over or, or you don't harvest, which can be incredibly crippling. Mm -hmm. Right. I feel like that's kind of a lot of times I think the 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 uh, solution is possible or there or there are solutions out there. But the the thing that allows you to do that is to catch a problem very early and respond very quickly. And also even better than that is having an idea of what could be a problem, maybe in your area generally. And what are some pests that are really common? So, to go back, going back to your first question, some of those pests, um, uh, I would say, would be like spider mites are really big. If we're talking about insects and mites and things like that, the two spot spider mites really common. Uh, chili thrips, uh, or I'm sorry, onion thrips, and then to a to a, another degree, western flower thrips are pretty common in cannabis and a lot of other plants too. Um, much like the question in the very beginning, they're also going to become really, really common in springtime. And then they're kind of ramp up in summertime, I, I find is the case, especially when the annuals are starting to die out and the thrips and other insects that have gotten to a big proportion. They're looking for, you know, where are these plants? And it's your irrigated crops that they're going to go towards because uh, that's sometimes that's the only thing that's alive or only thing that's viable in a, in a, in a short distance. Um, I think that, and then what was your, what was your second question? It was things that are, how do you deal with them? Was it? Yeah. It was like, what's the most common, what's the hardest to control. So like, I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of things that you can do. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do, but like, what is really, once it gets a hold, you just are kind of screwed. I think one of the, I hate to say it, but one of the, one of the worst ones are uh, like a lot of root pathogens a lot of like fungal pathogens, like um, like Fusarium, for example, can be really difficult. Botrytis and similar necrotrophic fungi, when they get really out of hand uh, very quickly, which can happen um, because you might not have noticed that they're there, and then they start to microsize the buds. And then instead of it, it's not like it happens sequentially, it can often happen like all at once, right? So that mm -hmm. is kind of like well, the flower is already, um, you know, colonized. So it's so some people would say you could remediate and that kind of thing. I don't know about that so much. Is there a but, treatment um, like, like following that? Like if you've got some sort of root pathogen and it spreads up into your plant and you're like, okay, I'm done with this. I'm not going to remediate and cut everything down. Is there a treatment that you can do? Like if you have living soil um, or, you know, do you just have to kind of start over? Like what's the deal? Cause I know living soil is like this kind of balanced ecosystem and throwing it out of whack or putting treatments into it to kill something that shouldn't be there. Like it's all just kind of like a, you got all these plates in the air spinning and <laughs> you can drop yeah. them all, all at once. I feel like, um, well, like with the root pathogens that I was talking about earlier and also like, oh, my seeds, like if you get like Phytophthora or Pythium or like some of these Fusarium root colonizations where like they girdle the plant stem, you're kind of, you're kind of done at that point. And that can happen super quickly. Um, very commonly associated with like a hydroponic setup or in a setup where the, where the, where the water becomes very warm very quickly or something like that, then um, that can, that can really facilitate that. And if that happens, like all the roots die or the stem gets girdled and there's no way for the, for mm -hmm. water and nutrients to move up the plant. Like you can't really fix that. That's like being decapitated. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a whole lot of solutions to that problem. So if that happens, which can be very rapid. Um, I, I feel like there's not a whole lot of recourse, even in sort of a living soil system. But um, I think the major benefit of a system like that would be um, uh, like the amendment of microbes that might um, sort of disintegrate 
the uh, the the pathogens from being able to colonize the plant through various means and and that sort of that ever swarm concept I was talking about earlier. I think the way that you defeat a constantly adapting um, horde of different organisms that might have overlapping strengths and weaknesses, but also even opposite strengths and weaknesses. So what works for one is not going to work for another. And in some cases, it might leave you vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, like in the case of the plant immune response. You know, it might be able to, to battle one thing and then battle the other thing, but both of them at the same time is going to be very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I feel like that's uh, that, that's my thought on that, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so if you're able to like keep that from happening, if you've got like parasitic microbes, um, microbes that are producing like uh, with the botrytis, there's there's microbial products you can apply that will um, produce antagonizing compounds that will damage the necrotrophs, that kind of a thing. And then of course keeping the environment like you know not uh, super hypoxic or or that kind of a thing. All all of those things come together. I think if you have a it's like um. It's like the oral microbiome or your intestinal microbiome where like uh, to some degree it might be better if you're able, like if you're getting, if you have like something that's really hurting you and you take an antibiotic, like an antibacterial, that might be better for your health in the moment because you might be in a very critical condition. But then you want to like have a more, you want to uh, sort of re-inoculate that flora. And I think mm -hmm. the same is true for the soil, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That totally makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Matthew. Hey. It's so nice to see you. I was so excited. I apologize. I actually was a little bit late today, but I've been, it's like the busiest January and fe uh, February I've ever experienced in the industry, which is really kind of peculiar. Um, honestly, I'm not really sure what to think about that, but all I can think is that production is going to really ramp up. And I remember last time we had you on the show, I've, you know, I have, a, I have like, Obviously, I have like a million questions for you, so I'll try to I'm gonna try to tame it back. But um, I think the biggest question I have is: last time you were here, we didn't really get to talk about practical applications for you know just the the very very basics. And I feel like I get a lot of calls and have over the years from people when they're really you know, in that preventative time frame, how they can really set themselves up for success from immature plants or seedlings. And, you know, the most common things I get calls where people find there's a lot of resistance or obviously like aphids. I feel like people have a really huge struggle with aphids. Um, I have this theory that, you know, with aphids and also like russet mites, I think are the two biggest things I get calls about. And then also, you know, obviously I think spider mites are just this plague that has plagued the industry forever. But I have this concept that we are, you know, we're officially becoming agriculture, right? It's slowly happened that this is no longer this small thing and that we're monocropping across the board with hemp. Whether people are doing small scale, you know, living soil cultivation, it's still essentially monocropping is my theory. Even if you want to really incorporate you know, polyculture as much as you can, still the primary crop that we're growing is cannabis. And I think that ultimately there are some things that are, you know, should really be of more concern to the industry. And I think that, you know, I've seen recently a lot of um, not so great pesticide tests, like people, I've seen some contaminated product across the board in the industry, whether it's on the hemp side or the adult use side. And I just feel like it's these people really jumping in at the end and, and shoving stuff together. So I thought maybe if you could just really give practical advice to growers, especially scaled growers on how they could stop themselves from having to use more heavy pesticide on some of the main, you know, the main culprits that really how are the bane of our existence in this industry? So like aphids, russet mites, like what would be some just simple tactics that you could apply to those things? For, well, so there's different, so like for cannabis, I feel like the two major aphids that people deal with, I, I said earlier, like learn what these are, learn what the pests are that you're actually going to deal with. A lot of them are, like you said, are shared with 
as agriculture gets more expansive. In fact, in the I'm going to be talking at the Living Soil Summit. I was talking about this before the podcast aired, but I will be speaking at that event. And that's actually a major aspect of the presentation is like agricultural trade is just going up. You know, I have many graphs that are doing this. You know, they're going really high up and, and we're, we're, we probably shouldn't expect, even though it's not particularly sustainable. And even if we are, are sustainably oriented, you know, folk who want to grow in a way that is ecologically beneficial and conscientious, conscientious and these sorts of things, um, other people might not care about this. Other large organizations might not care about this. And so that causes selection pressures that we also still will inherit because something like, for example, bud, there are various budworms that can resist things like DDT. I think we've talked about that, even, you know, terrible things like this and things you would never apply on cannabis, right? But I want to answer your question now. But my point is that I definitely agree with your, your point there that um, even if you do incorporate polyculture, there's still a bunch of plants uh, kind of in one local space that are the same species, right? And so that can have, that's going to have ramifications, not can, but will and does currently. Um, uh, one thing that occurs to me when you say that is something like a uh, beet leafhopper, which we've, which is pretty much the only vector for beet curly top virus. We see reports of it in places like Arizona, Colorado, uh, which is where it's been common in beets and other sorts of plants that it can colonize. And as you have more people growing large swaths of cannabis, I think you're going to have these concentration events, which we've also seen in various other, other pest species. But getting back to what you were saying, for example, aphids, two main ones. Uh, cannabis aphid is the specialist, right? Reistered aphid is a generalist. So right off the bat, if you're getting cannabis aphids somehow, they can only have come from other cannabis plants. Did you take in cuttings? Maybe they were on them. You know, maybe they came in on the air, especially for growing outdoors. Um, the cannabis aphid, and also its its close relative, the damson hop aphid, uh, the 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 close relative, host switches, but the cannabis aphid doesn't. And so um, the the significance of that is that in other research of similar species, they can move quite a long distance. And so again, as people are growing in these large pockets, you kind of have a a sort of Galapagos Island situation where you have these sort of um, uh, patchwork cultivation zones where uh, they might get exposed to something in one area and move to another area. The biggest thing that people can do is have like a specialist, I think, or some sort of cultivation lead who is actually going out and surveying the plants. I've even seen technologies where people are using um, satellite tracking and and drones and things like that to scour their plants in large uh, in fields and then they can actually use a machine learning to tell if the plants appear to be um, damaged in some way and and it's still like kind of crazy to me but apparently they can even suss out what kind of damage it is without identifying the pest with pretty high accuracy so if you're able to find that really quickly, then you can you can come back and use some of the more sustainable controls, I think, rather than in the past where maybe people didn't have the time or ability to like scout every single field, right, for like corn or something like this. For rice root aphid, um, and hopefully I'm giving not too garrulous an answer, but rice root aphid feeds on a bunch of different plants, a lot of sort of not very closely related plants. So it's got a lot of ways to adapt to these plants and... That means that if you know what it can feed on and you know that that's in your area, you can get rid of those plants that it could colonize on nearby your crop and then move into it. It's, a, it's another reason why I think it's important to pay attention to what you might be using in a polyculture type um, scenario because maybe the rice or aphid is benefited in that way. It And also if you're, if you're growing like banker strips, which I'm a big supporter of in a lot of cases. We were talking about parasitic wasps recently, uh, just now. And um, But if you don't have anyone going in and kind of checking to see, like, are these accruing things that we don't want um, that can also colonize your cannabis, then that can be a, a vulnerability rather than a strength. Yeah, I feel I appreciate that answer. I feel like the scouting, it's surprising to me how many cultivation facilities 
don't have very adequate scouting programs set up just right out the gate and that it's not that complicated. And I think people just don't really want to put a lot of labor towards proper scouting. So when you go into facilities, it's generally the first thing I do when I walk into a facility is just like look at their pest. You know, what what are the populations what's actually happening? And it's very surprising to me that it's not, you know, I don't see people flagging uh I don't see people yeah. flagging plants. I don't see color coded flags. I don't see signs on the wall. There's like a lot of that. And then also, you know, I've actually seen um, it was years ago, actually, when I very, um, you know, it was one of the first larger scale consulting jobs that I worked on in um, in Nevada, very uh, large scale. scale. They had, had that beat curly top virus and it decimated the whole entire thing completely decimated and it took quite a lot of work to deduce what had actually happened with the the beet curly top and the leaf hoppers and that they didn't even know you know we were trying to do you know pest management to figure out what was causing the problem it looks a lot of these things look like diseases but i think that as we you know when you see a whole entire crop completely destroyed from you know something like that it's it's just from a virus that came from a bug and you start to realize this is like actually this is actually agriculture. This is a new level. And I've seen it with all these different pests over the years. And I have my own like nemesis that I feel like I've battled with. But I think this to the practical solutions for people, scouting is generally just the simplest answer from the very beginning. And that screening process or quarantine process, right? Like in the in the very early stages, you have an opportunity to make, keep your plants clean and set up good practices. I mean, do you find that people don't have scouting programs or do, or do you find that there's more successful scouting programs? Yeah, I mean, at the risk of sounding like what I just said was kind of an impractical response, because you asked for practical uh, question or uh, answers or solutions. But I think that like really quickly, a small problem can become an, uh, a problem where there's not a lot of practical answers. Uh, right, especially at scale. So like, it's so like, I feel, I kind of feel like it's a cop out answer, and I don't mean it to be, but it's kind of like, yeah, like, get the problem when it's the, when it's the start, you know, like, but, um, uh, you know, I think that's kind of basic, too. <laughs> so, yeah, do you think you know, so? That, like, the amount of times I've gotten called into things like that is generally when when there's all across the board in cannabis, I notice it's like people will rarely catch it when it's a little problem. <laughs> They call you, right? That's they true. call you when it's a huge problem. So yeah, and that's been my and that's and I've said this before on on this show and other shows. And yes, I also find that it's kind of surprising um, how common it is that people don't. They might have like some person, or they might have like a team of people that have been cross trained a little bit. So like maybe one person's really in, maybe they have a personal interest. They find it interesting. They're just passionate about cultivation, agriculture, and they, and they feel that this is really important. And I would agree, it's very important, but I'm biased. Um, but then, and then they, they sort of like, take it upon themselves to kind of teach that information, um, do white space training, like when they have a few minutes, like, hey, this is what Ligus looks like. I know I did that. Um, you know, here's what this pest looks like. This is not this kind of pest. And these are different for this reason or whatever. Um, but uh, a lot of times, like, it's not like, uh, a specific role and oftentimes it doesn't I feel like get the kind of resource allocation that is important I think for cultivation um, but that's not always the case but I will say that it's rather common and it's really interesting when we consider that like even the word IPM is kind of a buzzword I feel like somewhat um, and, and I kind of I had this uh, idea recently where I feel like uh, it has a has like a connotation I feel like it's like a like a technician job but really um, if you're just like a holistically minded person all of the strategies and tactics I like to talk about and 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 frame in this in this comprehensive way it's just systems thinking it's systems of systems ecosystems and that kind of a thing so really you don't have to be like uh, some kind of like uh, technically minded person or like, um, you know, woeful academic in their ivory tower, just like studying up all of this like arcana about insects and molds and whatever. Um, it's really just like kind of paying attention to uh, some very basic ecosystem um, uh, qualia. 
That's a great, I love systems thinking. I just, I just gotta say, I think that's a great description because I feel like people get intimidated even when you talk about integrated pest management and don't fully understand like how to build a system or it's like this theory that they kind of get. But I think also I, I'm the reason I like it is because I've personally been that nerd on like always I'm, I want to know, I'm not like a full on expert in pests. Like that's your job, but I know enough and I've planted enough and touched enough plants at all different phases and battled enough of these insects and let the systems get out of control and learn the hard way. And I think that in this industry, I just, I see there's a lot of band-aid, you know, like going in late doing this. And there's a lot of practices that I just don't feel like are best practices. I think that there's a lot of corner cutting because the margins are so tight that ultimately there's not that person at facilities they don't and they don't have those scouting programs but also even if you train people and I'm very curious to your observation is my when I've trained people to be scouting or do other things or about pests I find that you know it's like something with the eye I feel like even with you know the highest power like dino lights or whatever people are using it's like some people just their brains maybe don't work that way or they don't catch it or they could be in the garden every single day being a garden tech and they could just not see something as simple as some of these the pest populations and it's fascinating to me that it's something that you can't there's certain things and I think they're just you know it's, it's like with greenhouse controls it's like you can have an automated system but can you just walk into a greenhouse and tell that the environmentals are off and I think that your pest strategy or system thinking is like making sure that you have the right people that, you know, actually are going to look, <laughs> they're going to look at the underside of the label. They're going to look at whatever your soil, your medium is, whether it's soil or something else. And I think that they're looking with intent, not just looking at the plants to see if the plants are healthy. And we also, we, I think we also overfeed in this industry a lot. And I think that the pests just love that. I just think that we, build these plants to be kind of like the perfect, you know, target, essentially the way that we treat cannabis plants. This is also a theory I've observed over time is like we baby them and we feed them way too much. And the pests are like, Oh, perfect. You know, it's perfect for me. So I don't know. Those are some of my thoughts, but I really appreciate your perspective. So I think I've learned a lot from you. So thank you for being here. I just want to say that a lot of your observations are similar to me. I, and I'll keep this quick, but basically, like, I'll give you an example from a client I just spoke to very recently where, uh, you know, the conversation was basically, like, as I was kind of onboarding and getting an, an understanding of their cultivation context, um, I quickly realized that their problem is the problem of many places where it's like, it's like, look, man, I actually know what we're doing wrong. I'm not allowed to change anything. I don't make that kind of decision. I don't have the authority for that. Oh, okay. So I actually can't help you because I'm going to tell you something you already know and you're just not going to be able to implement it. So that's kind of what I mean. It's very, it's very interesting how commonplace that is. And I think you're right. It's easy for me to say, Oh, we'll just have a budget for IPM, but it's not necessarily so easy for people too. So I can obviously say that and advocate for that, but I do also recognize that in especially currently it's, Things are getting consolidated and that kind of a thing. So I have to agree that your observations there are similar to mine. Awesome. Okay. So we'll get we'll get in another question or two before before the day is done. So John, you're up next. Um, but okay, I, I have I have one for you, and and this is more of just like. Uh, throwing around and, and throw out their question for you but like there's a lot of misconception and, and weird shit people say on the internet like if i feed my weed blueberries it's gonna taste like blueberries when you smoke it and shit like yeah, that did you see that post like, london did you see that post? oh yeah i saw that man i'm like <laughs> oh man you don't do it man don't jump into that that end of the pool don't do it man like I'm just don't do it man it's not know, worth it yeah i'm not gonna get I, it you know. i'm not gonna get it 
but um like what what are the what are the the things that you see that 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 are a little bit more inclined on maybe the bug end of it that are just like just clear misconceptions and and people that that that, that make these bold statements that just don't make any any sense when it comes down down to it like the 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 flat earthers if you will of the bug world <laughs> um <laughs> I feel like uh, there are some there's some answers we've already talked about before. I don't want to like rehash too much. Um, uh, uh, Johnny had a really good question last time we were on about like my opinions about like bricks and that kind of a thing. And uh, over time, I think it's important to to like explain like in detail. I feel like there's many different interpretations that people have had about like plant health and and to what degree it helps. Uh, for example, and like Evian said just now, like. Um, if you like overfeed, so to speak, then you can make the plants more susceptible or um, maybe put another way somewhat, it makes them, it at least helps the plant, the pests more rather than making the plant more susceptible. It makes the, it makes the, uh, or it just helps the insect more, which, or the pest more, which can be a slightly a different thing, but can have different um, ramifications. And I think a big part of this is like, like, for example, um, a misconception I think is that like, is like the idea of like plant health and immunity in general and, and how it functions. And although I do agree that the, the map is not the terrain, so to speak, right. There's models that we have about, um, you know, plant physiology and insect physiology, and it, it, it makes sense. And we do tests to, to show empirically that if this changes, then that's what we get. But like, for example, I often like to use like a, like a military or sort of like conflict related metaphor where like if you have a finite number of resources plants have to grow with those resources and they have to defend themselves and i've talked before about how they have a proportional response and that's what makes them so good at what they do they can't run away um, so if they're inundated with a bunch of different kinds of problems they have a dilemma how many resources am i going to unlock to deal with this problem while I'm simultaneously trying to grow, dealing with desiccation, uh, you know, dealing with a caterpillar versus a fungal mold versus that kind of thing. And it can be very uh, uh, problematic and damaging. Um, so like if a plant has, if you feed a plant and give it a lot of the nutrients it needs and, and, and even a microbiome that helps accentuate certain aspects of like nutrient uptake or uh, plant defense response or signaling and that kind of a thing, that's all fine and dandy, but if it actually, if it truly just lacks the traits necessary to defend itself, these people like a bunch of rifles and ammo and that's fine. But if like it's a tank and you're just shooting at it and it's deflecting, it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't really matter. You don't have the right weapon for the job essentially. And I think it's the same is true for the plants. What makes pests effective is that they have those penetrating weapons. Or they have symbionts that allow them to, you know, do better. Or it's not just one species, it's 10 different strains of a species. And um, different ones are differently, you know, adapted to like a desert or tropical environment or whatever. Um, so I think that people overlook this. I think that's a big misconception is that it's not just plant healthy and no problems. Um, a, a healthy plant can actually be good food for a pest, in fact. Um, is my is my understanding and it's, it's it's met out in research as well awesome and and uh, and i'll say i just want to comment on one thing that you, kind of you and evian were going back and forth on is you don't have budget for uh ipm you know professional or program until you have an ipm problem and then after that, you, you should by then know that you, you should always have a budget for an IPM person in my mind. It's, it's like it's like not having a health and safety person in your kitchen or like not having a safety guy on your work site or like it's, it's kind of like it's fly by the seat of your pants, zipper open behavior in my mind uh johnny did you want to go for the next question or you kind of you kind of disappeared there or do we want to move on to a what 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 the fuck is that i got a lot of photos to go through so we've got some time to to be able to kick johnny do you oh, have another sorry. question 
Yeah, sorry, I had, I had to take something out of the oven. Um, so my question is surrounding cannabis-specific pests, like the cannabis aphid or the hemp russet mite. Um, clearly, they didn't just, like, come out of nowhere. You know, they didn't just appear. Um, however, when I was in Northern California, oof, I'm trying to think, this was six years ago. Um, that's when really like a lot of the, a lot of like the old school growers up there started to encounter like the cannabis aphid and the hemp russet mite. Uh, and before then they were, you know, they, there would be aphids and, you know, the occasional broad mite, but seemingly, you know, these things just popped up, um, out of thin air and clearly that's not the case. So I'm kind of wondering what the earliest known, like, incident you are aware of for both of those pests and you know what really triggered their just massive dispersal and and where it became like um you know the plague essentially in you know a lot of the areas that cultivated cannabis yeah i really like this kind of question because it gets into um you know aspects of like cannabis evolution and plant evolution host specialization um so like so for example cannabis aphid hemp it might like you said specialists they don't as far as as far as we know maybe we find out this is not the case in fact i think there is some research trying to see right now if cannabis aphid uh, if it can't reproduce on other plants can it at least like eke out an existence feeding on a, another plant potentially and, and maybe there's something to that but it, it, it's probably not very well adapted to it um of course this is kind of speculative but like as far as when uh, the earliest example, it's hard to confirm. And what I what I kind of suspect, like for me, for me, um, if I'm remembering right, I think that I encountered um, maybe russet mite in the like uh, maybe for me, <laughs> based on my age and everything, maybe like the mid two thousands um, uh, for russet mites. I think probably the same for cannabis aphid, um, if I'm recollecting correctly. Uh, maybe if I was older, I could have recollected earlier too. Um, but I don't know how much that matches up with other people. Maybe the people have earlier examples as well. Um, kind of like, so cannabis has like an origin zone. And for those who don't know, and I think you guys all know that hop and cannabis um, share a common ancestor, maybe maybe 20 or 30 million years ago or so is maybe the split off time, depending on the molecular clock and whatever that people are, are using to estimate that. So ostensibly cannabis aphid and, and hemp russet mite uh, were around and their, and their ancestral groups were around before that and probably followed that split. Like I said earlier, there's the damson hop aphid. Well, it feeds on damson plum and hop. So, and the cannabis aphid feeds on cannabis. So probably that split happened with the damson hop aphid. Maybe it was already feeding on damson uh, plum or whatever, or, or plum type plants, prunus species. And then cannabis aphid is a population that had that ability and lost it. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but ostensibly, somehow, some way, people were bringing it uh, to other cultivation zones. And whether they were there at the initial point, like maybe, and it depends on who, what you call initial, right? Hemp has been grown for a long time. I think that um, I think that hemp russet mite was. I want to say that it was first documented. I have it in my russet mite video. I want to say in the 1960s or 1980s. I'm actually forgetting the exact year, but if you check out my video, um, uh, uh, that information is there for hemp russet mite in particular. That means that it's, it's probably been there before then, but that's when it was first kind of like um, documented and described in scientific literature. And cannabis aphid, I think, is around there or perhaps even earlier. Um, I really don't remember off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, but how much it was, how much people were dealing with it is a question because back then people were perhaps using really noxious stuff that would kill it very easily. And hemp and other rusted mites are also specialists too. So um, the idea is that for russet mites in general is that most species are specialists. So probably there was like a ancestor and they, and they broke off. There's a, they go after 
various different plants. Um, I don't know how many other the Cannabaceae also have uh, resin mites. I know there's a few other ones like associated, I think, with like Perisponia or Trema or other genera in the cannabis family. That's it. Really, is impressive that it really didn't become that this like widespread problem for for such a long time. But you know, with legalization and a lot of different places, there was probably a lot more you know sharing of genetics and you know just it opened up Pandora's box. Really, it was just there waiting, and then it it caught the mega highway to to be able to take off the way it did both of those pests. I think a big part of it is like, like you said, like with trade. And I'm curious if, if everyone else here thinks, or I'm curious what people think here that um, maybe the propensity of seeds, I don't know. Like, do you think there were more people just taking cuttings and trading those? Or do you think that happened less proportionally than like seeds being traded and, and given to people and things like that? Cause cannabis aphid can't be like on a seed or, or, or live in like a seed pouch or anything. And recipe mites, People have asked me if that's possible, but it's not possible as far as I understand. So that can kind of have like a, um, you know, kind of like a neutralizing effect. If the plant got infested, but the seeds are fine and you don't have any other like uh, material like that, maybe that's the case. What do you guys think? I mean, I think back in the day, there was a lot less clone sharing and a lot more propagation from seed you know, where people would share clones, but it would be really tight knit groups versus, you know, people mailing clones or whatever. And I do, yeah, I think that the seed, you know, the amount of seeds that were cultivated versus clones, um, you know, in, you know, in the past was significantly higher. I, if I, I don't know at all, if this is the case, it would be nice if there were studies to show it, but I don't think there are any. But like when we were growing a lot of hemp in the in the U.S. and like Eurasia and that kind of thing, I imagine that hemp resomite was a problem. Um, uh, but people were probably using pesticides um, that probably killed it really readily, and so maybe that is uh, what allowed us to not really notice it so much. And maybe, and this is not something I don't support, but the advent of people growing without those noxious toxins and growing in like living soil or, or growing outdoors in like Northern California using sustainable methodology. Um, I think that, that might have had an effect too. I'm not saying that that's the reason, um, but I think that um, that transition, you know, might have allowed for some of that as people were transitioning away from some of those toxins and finding better ways to control things. Uh, what, and I say very much better than uh, than um, using a bunch of systemic pesticides and things like that. Even if it lets some encroach more, um, sometimes um, I think superior cultivation methods beat it out. Yeah, I mean, I know that people use really noxious pesticides, like it was pretty much standard for for years and years uh, for a lot of people. Actually, Mark, I have a I have a thing for you um, since you were mentioned. I should have said this more time about the nepetalactone, but uh, the tea I've been drinking, the tea I've been drinking um, since you were mentioning that uh, is actually called a uh, mi xiang tea or honey black tea, honey black tea. And mm. it's called that, it's called that because they let leaf hoppers feed on the tea leaves and that causes them to have a defense response. And I, I agree, it has a little bit of a, like a honeyed note to it, especially when it's more warm, it's cooled off a little bit now. Um, but if you let the right proportion steep and, um, and, and you drink it, um, this is like a, this is a, they call it a black tea, but it's kind of like a oolong puar kind of tea. And uh, I just think it's interesting because people have talked about that before, like, oh, maybe I should have a little bit of, just a little bit of pest to get those uh, compounds flowing. But I'd rather prime it in a different way that didn't also induce damage. But just a funny little thing. I think it's related to what you were talking about earlier about like a, a defense response and attractants and, and how that can have effects in the plant. <clears throat> Well, it, it's interesting because the um, the nepetalactone biosynthetic pathway is a terpenoid um, synthetic pathway, and when you when you answered my question and you started talking about farnesine, right? Um, it reminded me. Uh, well, 
I think farnesine is in that pathway. I'm not looking at it off the top of my head, but I think somewhere farnesine's in that pathway. But check this out. This is really cool. So, um, so if you hydrogenate um, nepetalactone, you make something called dihydronepetalactone. Go figure, right? Taking out the double bond that's in there. And, um, you know, the, the, the essential oil of cat mint which is enriched with nepetalactone is really herbaceous, very loud herbaceous. It's like freshly mowed grass, <laughs> like not the most desirable, you know, smell. It smells like, like, I don't know, like a greenhouse in the middle of, you know, just before things get really super fragrant. So when you hydrogenate the oil and you convert nepetalactone to dihydronepetalactone, there's some other, terpenoids and sesquiterpenoids that come along for the ride. So there's beta caryophylline that's in there. There's osamine that's in there. And so all these compounds have double bonds. And when they get hydrogenated, it turns the essential oil from a loud, herbaceous, grassy, freshly mowed grass kind of smell to a lemony, minty, hint of licorice kind of smell, right? It's totally cool. I mean, we couldn't have predicted that until we actually did the transformation. So as it, it turns out, you know, the pedalactone, which is a cyclic enol ether, is at the oxidation state of an aldehyde. And so when it reacts, say, on the skin with moisture, it, it immediately goes to a derivative called ne nepetalic acid, which essentially is an aldehyde. And that aldehyde elicits skin toxicity reactions. In fact, so severe were the responses when we were doing whole animal testing in both guinea pigs and, and um, mice that we had to actually report this under Tosca. So when, you, when you're in the chemical industry and you're testing things and you find a very severe allergic reaction, you're supposed to report that immediately. It's something called the 8E reportable. And so we, we reported this because I don't think anyone had ever observed this kind of effect before. But when you hydrogenate the oil, that effect went away. Not only did the effect go away, but like I said before, we approve, we approve the essence. But this is what I want to tell you because I think this is totally cool and along the lines of what you were thinking. If you do a literature search on dihydronepetalactone, you'll find that it was actually discovered in the anal secretion of the rove beetle, Right. So it's one of those it's one of those signaling molecules to insects. Don't go here, <laughs> right? So when the beetle poops that out, I guess the beetles that come up from behind, or when they smell it, they're repelled and they 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 go elsewhere, right? Because it's kind of like it's this chemical language that they have, and it's just so interesting that it's these it's these napetalactone kind of molecules that are found in both plants and insects. So um, as it turns out, so dihydronepetalactone is actually a good insect repellent. And that was a project I worked on when I was with my former employer. But that uh, insect repellent is actually being commercialized by a company out in San Francisco who's doing production down in Louisiana. But I think it's going to come to the market this um insect repellent season so look for a product called nip it i think it's n-i-p-t i think that's how they're spelling it but um it's just so interesting right matt that you find these compounds in plants but they're also in insects and more importantly they're part of the chemical ecology right so this whole field of how insects communicate with each other through through chemistry and we were talking um with the soil guy couple of weeks ago about the same kind of chemistry happening in soil, how there's chemical communications between these species, between fungus and between bugs and between microbes and insects. And we found uh, a really good termiticide. And when we, when we went to go test it against termites, we actually found out that it attacks the microbes that are in the gut of the termite that the termite needs to digest wood. So termites don't eat wood. I guess they do forage on wood, but if they don't have these guts that can break down cellulose in their gut, I guess they'll 
starve or whatever they won't break it down into sugars and whatnot yeah that, that's correct they rely on it. in fact termites are descended from cockroaches if you can right. believe it or not so right. yeah they, there's, there's a good butters. symbiont that breaks down the wood if they don't have that and that's one thing that i'm talking about here with the ever swarm maybe don't target the bug target its symbiont and that kind of thing there, there might be ways to do that oh well, yeah Okay. Yeah, but I, I, before I think we go, we got it. We got cool it. We got to do the last section here before we get too late because we got we've got lots of photos that people have submitted. So I hate to cut you guys off there because you, you have brilliant fun, but we've only got like ten more minutes, and I've got like seven thousand photos sent to me thus far. So we got it. We got to try and do some of them for them. So this is our what the fuck is that section of the show where we we ask. Um, Matthew Gates, what the fuck is that? Um, and <laughs> it should be fun. I've had a bunch of people send photos. Some of them are just so fucking EBGB creepy. I'm sorry, but you're here and that's your fault. So get ready to enjoy. All right, Matthew Gates, are you ready for your first one? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, here we go. What the fuck is that? It's kind of hard to see, to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, the individuals. I mean, I see a bunch of individual things. It's kind of hard. Let me let me see if to... I can zoom in. Can't really. Oh, zoom zoom in. In I can't really <laughs> zoom in. Oh, I was thinking fire ants, but I'm like, are they? Are they fire? Yeah, I wanted. They're to not. They have like spider out. legs. They're really pretty gross when you get in there. Yeah, it does look like it does kind of look like ants piling on and attacking something. And it, it kind of has the same reddish hue, red russety brown, reddish color of like fire ants. But I couldn't quite tell. All right. This one this one truly got me. Ready? What the fuck is that? Anna, like a bunch of, why a, did you do this to people. me? Why did you send this to me? This is tra this is traumatizing to look at. This is truly, truly god awful. Yeah, I wonder if it's uh, it looks like a lady beetle, uh, maybe the corpse of a lady beetle being attacked by a bunch of, um, what I would interpret to be maybe mold mites, detrivores. So that that's what I think is is being seen here in this picture. Yep. All right. Next, next photo, and Anna is Anna's dropping some some superpower here. Um, actually, we got a J five sent so many photos, it's ridiculous. So I'm going to try and pick a a fun one, maybe that's not an enemy. See here. All right. I like this one. All right. Here we go. Ready? And what the fuck is that? Well, it looks like a wasp of some kind. Some kind of like solid. I feel like it's a solitary wasp and not a, a you know, like a you social wasp, like a paper wasp or something like that. I'm not sure. I get my wasp. I get my solitary wasp mixed up all the time. Is it a specid? Is it, um, you know, something in the uh, the spider wasp family? Is it um, something else? Um, I, I'm not quite sure, to be honest. Looks like a bug to me. Yeah. Uh, assassin, is an assassin bug in the category of wasps, Matt? Or is it is it considered a, a, a separate bug? It's in the group of like... Uh, Assassin bugs are the, um, they're in like the hemitra, the piercing mouth part having insects. Look, here's, here's one. What, what is that? That looks uh, kind of like something in uh, the cricket or grasshopper, probably in the cricket uh, group. Maybe it's a tree cricket, which I think would be like Oacanthus genus. But I'm not sure if that's a genus <laughs> specifically. Looks like a hopper. 
All right, it's the next one. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta dig up the next. Can you, you sent me a pretty, pretty darn tuned good one. This is, this is, this is truly. Uh, let's see here. All right. Ah, uh, oh, this is this is hard to look at. So ready? What the fuck is that? Well, I mean, are those spider mites on some silk? I'm not sure. I, I see more larva on there than I see spider mites. But larva of what? Do you think? Can you see if I, I think I see a spider? I think I see like a spider mite. Yeah. Um, those small little the small things, maybe they're maybe they're like smaller mites that have gotten into the silk or something. It's kind of hard to see. If it was moving, it might be more obvious. Let me see if I send it if I send you over the copy. And it should be in your in your in, you should have a copy in your phone now. Maybe it'll be a little bit more detailed. It's quite creepy looking to me. Do you, do you have more context for him there, Evian? On that, do you have a little bit more context on that photo? Me? You you were muted. I, am I muted? Sorry, I could not for the, life, for the way the screen was find my unmute button. So, you know, what's interesting is um, this is from a consulting job a couple years back, and there were the they were not indeed spider mite larva. They were some other form of larva and we couldn't figure it out. And there was some sort of webbing and we were deeply, I'm trying to see if, because there was a video also. So I'll see if I can find that. But that's what the initial thought was like, oh, it's spider mites, but it actually indeed was not. And it was the strangest larva that we had seen on something like that. It was really quite disgusting. Um, and Did you find what it was? We sent samples. I, I, we sent samples, and I believe it was some sort of um, like a larger mite or something. I believe is what it ended up being, or something. It was it was something strange. So that's why I was curious if you could just identify by looking at it, because we thought initially like, oh, it must just be this, but it wasn't. And it was. Really I do agree. Um, some of these, like some of these, these uh, uh, like uh, like London is showing, like some of these look kind of vermiform. Kind of like a russet mite, which is way smaller than a spider mite. Yeah, but I'm not, but I'm not sure. I mean, maybe they got stuck in the webbing. Russet mites, by and large, don't produce silk. Spider mites, for the most part, do. I guess it's possible. Sometimes you can have two different pests in one area, yes, uh, which can be very right. confusing. You know? Yeah. I was like instantly spider mites, and I'm like, those are long looking. Those are weird looking bugs. And then, okay, I, I, I think I have one more. This one. So Evian has to come in with the ringer because that was that was a tough one. That was a tough one for sure. And then, okay, let's see here. Anna Anna's going to have the last. Oh, wait. I, th I didn't. I don't want to miss Johnny. Here we go. This is, this is the last one of the evening. What the fuck is that? That also kind of looks like this mold mites. Incredibly on challenging like a... to do, by the way, everybody. Just, just so I just want to call this out. This is like we're we're showing just random photos of bugs and getting them to name them and stuff. It's not an easy, easy thing to do. So, round of applause for Matthew Gates. Hit that like button. We appreciate you. Yeah. What do you guys think? It does kind of remind me of like mold mites on some decaying organic matter, some like some stem material or something. We've talked about it before where sometimes people will look at the mold mites or something similar and they'll think, oh, that's the bug. It's attacking my plants. Or are you talking about the worm type thing? Um, that does look like a caterpillar maybe, but it's kind of um, kind of hard to see in, in the picture. Like you say, it is kind of difficult without uh, some other angles. But I'm seeing a couple of different things. I see the mite-like things and I see this like sort of caterpillar-esque form, but I'm not sure. Maybe it's a... Uh, I mean, in the roots, some caterpillars do eat the do attack uh, the stem, but this looks pretty damaged and like decaying. So maybe it's like a corn ear, or not corn earworm, a 
a uh, um, like a cucumber beetle larva, a wireworm type thing, maybe. I'm not sure totally. Well, Matt, so there were a lot of cucumber beetles um, around on that site. Um, you know, this was pretty early in the season, if I remember correctly. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that it would be at that stage of its of its life. And but I mean, I don't know if um, cucumber beetle larva, if they will tunnel into plants, these plants, there was um, a pretty good amount of them that actually had that yellow caterpillar looking thing going inside crawling in and they were small very you know immature plants and it was wet and cold and those things were were kind of ravaging those particular plants and and i you know i think that that was the culprit of why it was dead in the first place and then those mold mites moved in afterwards to kind of do some cleanup well that makes me feel a lot better about the answer um i will say that i feel like to answer your question, yeah, I think that um, it's definitely the case in other, especially like plants where you want the subsurface uh, structures like garlic or onion or something like that. Uh, yeah, they'll definitely bore into the stems or the root zone. I just feel like this larva looks a little bit like emaciated or like it's almost like a, usually I expect beetle larvae to be a lot less plush, a little bit more shiny, a little bit more kind of rigid almost. And I'm not sure I'm getting that from this picture, but it could just be the angle or maybe it's moribund. Maybe it's dying for some reason. Um, but yeah, that does make me feel more confident that it might be like a, a corn beetle or a diabrotica larva. And with that being said, what the fuck is that? We'll have to wait. Until next episode, we have Matthew Gates on, which will be coming in a in a few months. So save your like, get out there and like take some more bug pictures. I had I I, I, I sent a few messages out there, but I, I was expecting a lot more weird shit in my me message box. Just so we're all clear, and I think y'all can do a better job of that. Um, with that being said, Matthew Gates, thank you for being our awesome uh, exemplary. Uh, guest for the evening um where can people find support and check you out um in the in, in your world if they want to get to know you and see what's going on in your world well thanks a lot for having me great questions as always i really I really appreciate it and it lets me deep dive some of these subjects i'm passionate about especially the the nitty-gritty details you can check me out at zenthanol.com for professional inquiries you can support me over at patreon if you want to if you want to suggest some videos, there's uh, there's different uh, tiers for the for the patronage um, and that sort of a thing. You can also get access to my Discord channel as little as one dollar a month on Patreon. So that's been very useful for a lot of people. To have an, uh, an IPM specialist in the back of their pocket. You can check me out at, at youtubecom sentinel for a lot of these educational videos. I often say, hey, you know what? Don't con don't you don't necessarily like, contact me if you don't need the help. There's a lot of free information out there. I think that's really important to give to, to people. So uh, check out that info there. If you still need uh, help, please contact me. And um, I'd be happy to find solutions for you guys uh, with an IPM or a plant health related problem. So I appreciate it, everyone. Um, I look forward to our mutual success. <laughs>